happy to welcome We are so happy to welcome all of you to cohort 18 of the GLS Campus Suicide Prevention Grant Program. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. We have a very robust agenda. First, we will introduce you to the larger GLS community as well as the as well as SAMHSA's Suicide Prevention Resource Center and SAMHSA Grants Management. Then we will talk about how to get your grant started and the federal requirements of your grant program. We will discuss setting up your account with a payment, payment management system, drawing down your funds, your notice of award, special terms and conditions, budget monitoring, and overall federal reporting requirements. Please keep in mind that this orientation webinar is, to, is designed to provide an overview of the program. Over time, you will get acquainted with the program and grants management requirements, your SAMHSA partners, and of course, all of the different federal acronyms we use here at SAMHSA. I will try to tell you what some of those acronyms, acronyms mean during the webinar so that you could get used to our government lingo. Okay, next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce you to your SAMHSA government project officers, known as the GPOs. The GPO is your primary point of contact for your grant. GPOs provide you with technical assistance and they oversee and monitor your grant program. As listed here on your slide, you can see which GPO is designated to work with your grant. And I will turn it over to uh, Jennifer Capella for introductions. Hi everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Capella. I am um, a government project officer for the grants listed below. You've definitely heard from me. So please um, get back to me if you haven't. And I look forward to working with all of you during this grant program. And I'll say Tara Para is another colleague of ours. She's actually um, lives in Florida and she's uh, in Sarasota. So she, we are um, sending her positive thoughts because she's um, in the middle of a hurricane right now and not able to be here. But um, she, I know she's looking forward to working with you as well. Amber? Oh, no, Amber, I want you to introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. My name is Amber Green, and I am a GPO for uh, the GLS Campus uh, Suicide Prevention Grant, and I'm looking forward to working with you all. Okay. So you, sh as, uh, thank you, Jennifer uh, and Amber. And again, as Jennifer said, we are uh, sending our best wishes to Tara and hope that she's uh, safe uh, and, uh, and has been safely evacuated there in Florida. Um, so this is your, uh, this is your SAMHSA campus, uh, government project officer team, and we will be working with you and you should have received a welcome letter that Jennifer was referring to from your GPOs requesting information needed to set up your very first individual introductory call. So please remember to follow up with your GPO to set up that call. Um, we also wanted to highlight that some grantees in this cohort are funded annually, and some are funded, uh, 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 some are multi-year funded. So those grantees who have an asterisk next to their name, as listed on this slide, are multi-funded grantees. Their funding for all three budget periods was issued at the beginning of their grant. All other grantees have received only their initial budget periods funding, with subsequent years funding to be released uh, before the future years begin. Uh, we will discuss this in more detail later in your webinar. Next slide, please. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Jen now, who will uh, provide some information on the required activities. Next slide, thanks. Thanks, Portland. Thanks, Amber. 
Um, so let's talk about the required activities of the grant, and then we'll discuss some supports that are in place to help you accomplish the goals and objectives of the program. So the first required activity of this grant program is to create um, a network infrastructure, which includes a crisis response protocol and post mention plan to link the institution of higher education with appropriately trained behavioral health care providers who treat mental and substance use disorders. The network shall include providers with knowledge of local behavioral health crisis response services, mobile response, crisis stabilization services, crisis lifeline call centers, and other support services, as well as traditional outpatient providers and emergency departments. Number two, develop a plan to seek input from relevant stakeholders in the community and other appropriate public and private entities to implement the program. Three, to administer voluntary mental and substance use disorder screenings and assessments and provide information and re referral services as appropriate. To train students, faculty, and staff to identify, respond effectively, and make appropriate referrals for students in experiencing mental and substance use disorders, distress, crisis, or risk of suicide. The trainings should be evidence-based. Um, we ask that you operate hotlines or promote access to the availability of 24-7 crisis services um, through local services and the National 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. We ask that you provide outreach services to inform students about mental and substance use disorder resources and services, including recovery support services and how these concepts vary across cultural groups. That you educate and disseminate informational materials to college students, families, faculty, and staff to increase awareness about suicide, suicide prevention, mental health promotion, substance misuse prevention, and mental and substance use disorders and promote resiliency. And we ask that you develop and implement educational seminars for students to enhance life skills, resilience, and promote social connectedness that align with campus initiatives and activities. Implement strategies to reduce access to lethal means among students with identified suicide risk. And conduct an assessment of the mental health and substance use disorder needs of students. Um, next slide, please. There are also a number of um, activities that your grant may partake take in if your funding and staffing allows but are not required activities. These are called allowable activities. So you may choose to, to develop a plan to provide mental and substance use disorder prevention and treatment services to college students by employing appropriately trained staff. Services may include recovery support services and or programming and early intervention treatment and management, including um, the use of telehealth services. You can develop supportive policies addressing students who need a medical leave of, leave of absence due to the presence of SED, SMI, or co-occurring disorders. You can support college student groups on campus, including athletic teams that engage in activities to educate college students, including activities to reduce negative attitudes about behavioral health disorders and to promote mental health. Or you can conduct research through a counseling or health center at the institution um, to improve the behavioral health of students. Um, now, I wanted to mention in the required activities in Portland, we'll discuss this at, at, next. Um, but the required activities are really designed um, in a comprehensive public health approach um, to suicide prevention on campus. Um, so that public health approach should be, should be reflected in your activities of your grant. And now I think we move to the next slide and I'm going to pass it along to Portland. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, now we'd like to introduce you to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, which was established in 2002 to support the original national strategy for suicide prevention. This is our National Technical Assistance Center to support suicide prevention. It is federally funded by SAMHSA and it's housed in the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Um, the SPRC website provide several functions that might be helpful to you and your team. And I'm gonna just highlight just a few of them here on this screen. So this is our website. Uh, they, uh, their website has archived hundreds and hundreds of resources, toolkits, and programs to support suicide prevention efforts in a variety of set settings. They, have, uh, they offer free online trainings and a number of toolkits and informational videos. If you scroll down 
I really, really want to emphasize this. If you scroll down this page, you'll see a banner for the weekly spark, which is a weekly newsletter that can keep you updated on the latest research, events, and news in suicide prevention. Um, the SPRC website also has pages with resources specific to campus suicide prevention, which you can find by clicking on the colleges and universities button. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that this is what SPRC's colleges and universities page looks like. You will see there are a number of specific areas where you can dive deeper into the left uh, navigation. And if you scroll down from this view, you will also find a lot of resources specific to campus suicide prevention that you can filter in different ways to find information that you're looking for. I would like to highlight a really uh, awesome uh, resource that our uh, Suicide Prevention Resource Center provides on the next slide, and it's the virtual learning labs. Um, this, these, There's uh, about four different modules that grantees can access, uh, and, and you might find them very useful in developing a strategic plan for your grant. Please feel free to visit this site to see which modules might be helpful to you as you begin your strategic planning activities for this grant. Next slide, please. I also want to take this opportunity to highlight SAMHSA's comprehensive approach to suicide prevention. The comprehensive approach to campus suicide prevention is an evidence-based model adapted for colleges by the SPRC, uh, by SAMHSA's Suicide Prevention Resource Center and the Jed Foundation, drawing on the US Air Force Suicide Prevention Program. The required activities for this grant aligns with this evidence-based model and should be used to support your strategic planning efforts. To learn more detailed information about uh, our comprehensive approach to suicide prevention for colleges and universities, please visit the SPRC website. Okay. Another resource that we have available to you is our National Collegiate Listserv. We'd like to share this information uh, with you here. It's listed on the slide, uh, the link here. This, and we're so grateful, we have um, Dr. Michael Nordoff. He's the Associate Professor of Psychology at Mississippi State University, and he's also an alumni grantee. He is the moderator for this listserv. So if you are interested in joining this group, it's really a wonderful group where we have um, universities, um, and grantees, um, it's sort of a peer-to-peer -peer sort of listserv where grantees can post questions and you can see that other peers will respond to those questions on a wide range of different uh, campus uh, collegiate mental health topics. So if you'd like to join this group, please send an email to Michael at the email listed on this uh, website you have to use a university email address and just submit your email address. Um, and if you'd like to, you can submit more than one email ad address if you'd like to have other project staff members uh, join this listserv. So I will turn it over now to Amber. Thank you, Portland. Um, so next we're gonna talk about the active GLA state grantees. Um, we'd like you to be aware that SAMHSA funds GLS state and tribal youth suicide prevention grants to states and tribal organizations to create and implement statewide tribal suicide prevention plans for youth age 10 to 24. This is a list of all current state and tribal grantees. We encourage you to identify colleagues in your region or state to begin to develop their, these partnerships. Find partners amongst your colleagues. We want you to talk to them and learn from each other. You, your GPO can help you make these connections. 
And these are the uh, jail estate uh, grantees that you can see, it's two pages. go. Next, we're going to meet your SAMHSA support team. My name is Amber Green. I'm going to introduce you to your federal support team who you'll be working with on a federal level. This slide illustrates your support team. SAMHSA's goal is to ensure progress on SAMHSA supported grants and cooperative agreement programs while minimizing risk to federal funds. The GPO, GMS, and GMO are the SAMHSA personnel who work together as a team providing guidance and support to recipients. It is highly recommended that you copy both the GMS and GPO on all email communications. Each grantee is assigned a team of individuals as illustrated on this slide. First, you have your government project officer and your GPO serves as the primary programmatic point of contact for award recipients. Your GPO assists recipients with programmatic technical issues and technical assistant resources. Your GPO assesses recipient compliance with program laws, regulations, policies, requirements, and guidelines, and provides appropriate programmatic clarifications. Your GPO will monitor recipient programmatic performance, reviews progress reports, and provides feedback to recipients as needed. Your GPO will conduct post-award site visits, along with overseeing and approving SPARS goals and quarterly data submission. Your GPO reviews and recommends approval for recipient terms and conditions submissions, reviews and recommends approval for requests for post-award amendments to the project, and your GPO will also review and recommend approval or disapproval of continuation applications. Next, we're going to talk about your grants management specialist, your GMS who works closely with the government project officer, your GPO, um, whose official responsibility is for technical and programmatic aspects of the grant. Your GMS oversees the fiscal administrative aspects and non-programmatic aspects of the grant. Your GMS interprets grants administration laws, regulations, policies, and guidelines, and provides technical assistance on financial aspects of grant implementation. Your GMS serves as the primary point of contact for all grants management, financial reports, and correspondence. Your GMS reviews, recommends approval for recipient terms and conditions submissions, along with reviews and recommends approval for requests for post-award amendments to the project, and performs budget analysts of new and continuation applications to, to determine allowability and reasonableness of proposed costs. Grants Management Office is authorizing official for funding and program budget changes. They review and resolve all terms and condition requirements in Terms Tracker. Great. Before we continue, Thank I would like to pause it. The line. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Amber. I'm sorry. Oh, I was saying before we continue, I would like to pause and open the lines for any questions regarding the operational definitions and criteria of the required indicators. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so thank you, Amber. So yes, we're gonna uh, pause right now for your questions and answers regarding the content that we've covered so far. Um, after the, our next uh, segment of today's webinar, we'll, we'll focus on grants management and reporting requirements. But before we do that, we wanted to check in to see if you had any questions about the information that we've just shared with you. And I think I see a question here in the Q&A. Oh, OK. Yeah, there was a question about, there were a couple questions, actually, about a press kit um, that you answered and said, no, that everybody should use their internal press releases and protocols um, for any press. And then um, please CC your GPO on all correspondence you have with SAMHSA. Yes. So, yeah, we wanted to, it's really important to emphasize this, that um, um, that whenever you're reaching out to Aaron Harris, your grants management officer, make sure you copy your GPO. And because uh, we're all kind of coordinating and working together as uh, uh, Amber highlighted in that one, in that previous slide. Um, I heard you say site visit. Do you come to site visit? 
Um, someone had a question by site visits. No, it's not a standard uh, operating procedure where GPOs conduct site visits of all other colleges. We do that on a case by case basis. And if something like that is planned, we would be working uh, with a grantee. So we're going to wait uh, to uh, answer your question regarding grants, multi-year funded grants. We're going to wait till the next segment to answer that question. It looks like Amber has a lot more IHEs than others. Is this going to affect our access to her? Oh, um, I don't know what IHEs is referring to. I think institutions to. of higher education. Oh, so here at SAMHSA, uh, grantees, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, myself, and Amber, we work with a lot of different grantees here at the Suicide Prevention Branch. And we all have similar grantees in our portfolio. So uh, you will not have any problems at accessing Amber. Um, and the reason why you, so just so you know, you did not see, uh, all of the grantees that I work with, and you did not see all of Jennifer's grant, uh, grants that she works with. Amber happens to have a larger amount of grantees because Amber just works on the Campus Suicide Prevention Grant Program. I wanted to reassure you uh, that you will not have any problems accessing or reaching out to Amber. So I think we're gonna move on now to um, the grants management overview segment of today's webinar. And I will now turn it over to Aaron Harris and Jillian Hart. Good afternoon, uh, this is Aaron Harris and I will be managing the uh, this new cohort. Uh, Jillian Harp is also on and will be assisting. Uh, she also has her own portfolio of previously awarded uh, GLS Campus Suicide Prevention Grants. Next slide, slide please. Okay, so this is my contact information. I am assigned as your uh, primary contact for any uh, financial business or grants management related issues. I coordinate directly with the SAMHSA GPO assigned to your, uh, to your grant. And uh, my main role is to also enforce grants administration policies and regulations, including the approval of funding, uh, carryover funds, no cost extensions, and any other forms of post-award amendment. Uh, feel free to contact me by email. I do ask that you try to uh, include your grant number in in the subject or somewhere in your email. If you do contact me that way, that just makes it much easier to find the grant record. Next slide, please. So just a brief overview of some of the topics we're going to be covering in this section, uh, roles of res and responsibilities of the grantee and, uh, and of SAMHSA, an introduction to ERA, which is the main component uh, related to your grant. Also, there'll be resources and various links to help you get started. And all of these will be in the, um, in the slides you will receive. So we might go over these quickly just for time's sake, but um, but you will have access to them. And if you ever need assistance with something specific, feel free to reach out. We'll also go over the grant award life cycle from pre-award, post-award, and, uh, and then the requirements for each year of the grant, as well as an introduction to your notice of award, as well as a brief discussion of allowable a lookable and reasonable costs, including funding restrictions. Next, we'll go over post-award management, including changes to the award and prior approval, as well as reporting requirements. We will then address the summary of key submission dates that are upcoming, as well as briefly discuss the continuation application as appropriate. Now, for those that are multi-year funded, um, uh, instead of submitting an application, um, you'll be submitting the same components essentially, but through 
the ERA terms tracker. Uh, you're still required to, uh, all the other requirements are the same, it's just that uh, uh, you need to submit uh, these components via the terms tracker. And of course, we'll briefly touch on that as we go through. Uh, we'll also briefly discuss drawing down funds, including those requirements and additional resources. Next slide, please. So briefly, there are several main roles and responsibilities on behalf of the recipient. When we say grantee or recipient, this is the entity that receives the federal award directly. This is different from any subaward or, or contractual or consultant uh, entities that might receive funding through the main entity. Uh, then there's also the authorized organization representative. Uh, this role is identified as the AOR in grants.gov. However, ERA is re referenced this as the business official, um, as indicated on the SF424 form in section 21. And, and uh, this person is assigned the signing official role in ERA. This is the official point of contact. Uh, this is the designated representative of the recipient organization related to the award. Uh, this official certifies that the application applicant organization will comply with all assurances and certifications, and that the ap applicant organization will be accountable both to for the appropriate use of funds awarded and for the performance of the grant, as well as responsible to SAMHSA to ensure that the organization complies with all applicable federal laws and regulations, as well as terms and conditions of the award. Next slide, please. All right, and the project director uh, or PD, which is sometimes identified as the principal investigator, uh, this individual should not be the same as the business official, uh, as this is a potential conflict of interest. The project director or PI role is identified primarily by uh, by section 8F on the SF424 form, as well as through any post-award amendments to change key personnel. Uh, this is the uh, this is the individual designated by the recipient to have the appropriate level of authority and responsibility for any uh, technical or programmatic aspects of the of the grant and is responsible for day-to-day -day management of the grant including implementation of activity, activities in accordance with the work plan. Um, they're responsible for compliance with the programmatic financial and administrative aspects of the award, including uh, ensuring compliance with the terms and conditions outlined on all notices of award. Uh, the project director is responsible for creating and maintaining adequate documentation, including programmatic, administrative, and financial records and reports. They are responsible for measuring and documenting progress and achieving goals and objectives, as well as submitting required reporting reports, maintains and review budgets for, and responsible for cash management, including drawing down funds. Uh, they're responsible for reviewing and recording financial operations and returns, uh, federal funds for disallowed expenditures, Submit key personnel post award amendments for prior approval, among many other post award amendments. And they must refrain from doing business with the barred and suspended organizations. Uh, and they might, they're expected to report irregularities. Next slide, please. So SAMHSA utilizes NIH's Electronic Research Administration, or ERA. And this is the official electronic grant system for SAMHSA grants. Please be mindful of any um, emails and correspondence coming from ERA, such as ERA notify at mail.nih.gov or from DGM correspondence at samhsa.hhs.gov. All post award amendments requests, as well as responses to track terms. Uh, whether they're special conditions, annual reports, programmatic reports, or anything else, as well as continuation applications must be submitted by uh, ERA Commons. Next slide, please. 
So the ERA services is where you will reach out if you need assistance with any of the following. Um, ERA comments, including ERA assist, any, any issues with um, registration, uh, as either as a project director or business official or any other role related to the grant, as well as troubleshooting any post-award amendment submissions. Um, if you have any technical questions, please contact the ERA service desk. You can either submit a, a web ticket, contact them uh, toll free on the number on the screen and select four for SAMHSA grantees. And their offices are Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except on federal holidays when they're closed. Next slide, please. As a reminder, when corresponding with SAMHSA and ERA, remember that ERA is the primary way you will submit all correspondence related to your grant. Also, in all correspondence with SAMHSA, including directly to me, to your assigned GPO, or to any other uh, SAMHSA uh, uh, employee working on the grant, please include the grant number in the subject line. Uh, this is important to make sure we can actually look up your grant in the system, as well as the name, title, organization name, and contact information uh, for the in individual contacting us so we know who you are and we're not, uh, and we know uh, how to approach any questions you may have. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Here's a brief overview of various resources and links. Um, you can find information on getting started in ERA, as well as uh, roles for SAMHSA grantees, adding and updating accounts in ERA, uh, requesting signing official access for ERA comments, as well as guidance on how to respond to terms and conditions, uh, as well as submission of post-award amendments, uh, guidance on using the two-way correspondence feature, as well as requesting uh, submitting responses to uh, request for additional materials, and of course, contacting the ERA service desk. Again, all of these resources are available in the uh, in the slides. And if you ever need assistance with something beyond these, feel free to reach out. Next slide, please. Okay, the notice of award is the official legally binding document that notifies the recipient of the award. Um, contains and references all terms and conditions of the grant and federal funding limitations and obligations and provides the documentary basis for recording financial and programmatic obligations. All SAMHSA NOAs will be electronically mailed to the business official as indicated on the SF424 form, section 21, the authorized representative, standard terms and special conditions require response by the date identified on the notice of award. Finally, please remember to read your NOA carefully and in its entirety, as failure to comply with grants management and award uh, requirements can result in a variety of uh, corrective actions up to including and including uh, freezing your payment management system account, or in very extreme and rare cases, possibly as far as um, uh, termination. All right, next slide, please. Here are some sample uh, special conditions you might see on your, on your uh, notice of award. A revised detailed budget with narr narrative justification and SF424A, basically asking you uh, to submit a revised budget with uh, with information, um, with the corrections we specifically call out, or indirect cost rate agreement or cost allocation plan, a detailed breakdown for matching contributions, um, a required key personnel post award amendment, project director job or position description, 
uh, or contact information for the project director of our virus SF 424, uh, any programmatic concerns, and finally, participant protection concerns. Next slide, please. Okay, the disparities impact statement, uh, which is due November 29th, 2024, for all grantees in this cohort. It is due in the ERA Commons Terms Tracker. Uh, you're expected to identify and describe behavioral health disparities within your population um, and experience uh, disparate access, use, and outcomes. Provide a demographic table of the proposed number of individuals to be served, reached, or trained. Identify the social determinants of health domains and the cultural, culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare. Standards that you will work with to address and improve the population of focus. Uh, develop a disparity reduction quality improvement action plan to address these behavioral health disparities on data access, data access use and outcomes. And then you can find information on the disparity impact statement on the link below. Um, if you have additional questions, uh, please contact the, the assigned grants uh, the assigned GPO for your grant. Next slide, please. Just a note on award acceptance. Accepting a grant award or cooperative agreement requires the recipient organization to com organization's compliance with the terms and conditions of the notice of award, as well as all applicable federal policies and regulations. By drawing down funds from your award, recipients signal their agreement with abiding by all applicable laws, regulations, program requirements, policies, terms, and conditions. Uh, this award is governed by the uniform guidance in two Code of Federal Regulations or CFR uh, section 200 as codified by uh, Health and Human Services at 45 CFR section 75. Also referred to the Department of Health and Human Services Grants policy statement, as well as SAMHSA uh, additional directives and the standard terms and conditions for the fiscal year, uh, for the fiscal year in which the grant was originally awarded. In this case, 2024. Next slide, please. To respond to terms and conditions, uh, visit, uh, you submit via the ERA Commons Terms Tracker by the due date list on the notice of award. You can find information on, on how to upload a document in response to the term via the links included. And a note on the special conditions for key personal plus award amendments. Uh, you won't find those in the terms and condition in the terms tracker simply because those must be submitted as a post-award amendment. Uh, for information on submitting key personnel post-award amendments. Please see the, please refer to the link included in the slide. Next slide, please. And that concludes this part of the grants management overview. Uh, we have a few more sections, but uh, I would like to, but let's take a break to go over the, some Q&A. Are there any questions you can raise your hand? or type into the chat. I do see two hands raised, but they've been raised the whole time. Um, so um, A. Jones and Christine Conway, if you guys um, had a question, um, you can go ahead and ask. Um, or like I said, put in the chat or the Q&A. Okay, I do see in the Q and A that there was a question about um, about why some uh, grants multi year funded versus um, annually funded. Uh, this is more due to a high level um, beyond our control decision. We at the top of SAMHSA leadership on um, uh, based on the funding sources. So we we have both an annual budget as well as special 
funding as authorized by Congress. And sometimes that funding um, expires after a certain amount of time. And so we decide to utilize that funding to award all the funds all at once, uh, to utilize that and to make sure that grants are funded throughout. Uh, long story short, basically just different sources of funding. Um, essentially, they're the same. Uh, the difference mainly is in how you submit uh, uh, the documentation for the next year. Uh, specifically, uh, an annually funded grant, um, you will submit a continuation application through ERA's assist, um, while multi-year funded grants will submit responses to terms and conditions. Uh, you're still required to only spend up to each year's allocated funding. So in this case, generally no more than $102,000 per year, um, less depending on what your original application said. And there's a few other minor requirements. Uh, if you have any specific questions, if your grant happens to be multi-year funded, feel free to reach out. Um, one question is, our NOA says one year amount, but shows three years worth of funding. Mm -hmm. Yes, on the notice of award uh, for both uh, multi-year funded and annually funded grants, we list out future um, future amounts that uh, we are expecting to uh, to fund. So, for instance, for a three year grant that's annually funded, we might say in fiscal year twenty twenty four. Um. Uh, twenty twenty five and twenty twenty six with different all board amount. There's a lot more nuance, and we can, of course, uh, come to that later. Any other questions? All right. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Dillian, did you want to take over? Yes, thanks, Aaron. Hello, everyone. My name is Julian Harp. I'm another grants management specialist um, that has another cohort of uh, Garrett Lee Smith uh, awardees. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uniform guidance and the cost principles. Um, so as you can see on this slide, there's some things that all recipients are required to do. Um, so they are to ensure efficient and effective administration of awards, employ sound organization and management practices, and administer funds consistent with agreements, program objectives and terms and conditions. And really what that means is that all federal funds must meet um, certain requirements uh, when they are charged or used for specific programmatic goals and activities. So they must be allowable, the cost must be reasonable, necessary, and allocable. Um, there are, as you can see on this screen, in the Code of Federal Regulations, there are definitions that define um, these different standards that costs need to meet. Um, but essentially, for a cost to be allowable, it needs to be something that, one, is allowable by the Code of Federal Regulations, also is allowable under this grant program, um, and is necessary for the recipient to meet the goals and objectives of the program. Costs are reasonable if the amount that is being used for that specific cost is um, what a prudent person would pay in a similar situation. And then allocable, um, the goods or services involved should be chargeable to the federal award. What is really important about all of these is to make sure that your organization has adequate documentation that shows that any costs that are charged to the federal award meet these different um, requirements. If you have any questions about uh, the different items that the allowable, reasonable, um, allocable, please refer to the Code of Federal Regulations. You can also look at the um, SAMHSA's guidelines for financial management requirements. And then also you can always just reach out to your grants management specialist to ask any questions about, you know, if you're trying to figure out if a cost is allowable or not, or is it reasonable, you can always reach out to your grants management specialist and they can provide that support as well. 
Next slide. There are also funding limitations and restrictions on each award. Um, for this award, specifically in the NOFO, it states that food, including snacks and light refreshments, are an unallowable cost. Um, so a lot of times with the Garrett Lee Smith program, we see that um, on campuses, you know, meals or food or something like that is um, something that is want that is requested in the budgets, but that is not allowable. Um, so please make sure that you're looking at the funding limitations and restrictions in the NOFO um, and also in the Code of Federal Regulations. So, you know, what is an allowable cost from this grant and what is not. Next slide. These are also some other non allowable expenses for this award. So, stipends are not allowable. Um, like we just uh, went over, meals, food, refreshments, snacks, those are also unallowable costs. We also see a lot of times with this program that uh, costs related to sporting events or recreation. So if that's like a ticket to a baseball game or the movies or something like that, that that's something that um, is put into the budgets that we receive, those are unallowable costs. In addition to anything that is a promotional item or a giveaway. So a lot of times this comes up when um, recipients want to do a tabling activity or they're trying to um, maybe encourage uh, students to participate in a certain uh, activity of the grant. Anything that's a promotional item or a giveaway is also unallowable. And a note here, um, this is also something that comes up frequently, is the question is asked if matching funds can be used to cover the expenses for some of these unallowable things, such as food and giveaways. And the answer is no. Matching funds are held to the same test of, is it reasonable, is it allowable, is it allocable, as the same as the federal um, funds that are used. So matching funds cannot be used to meet any of these unallowable expenses. You can use other sources of funding though. So if you have another grant um, like a state grant or maybe a private foundation grant that allows you to use those funds to purchase unallowable costs as shown on this slide, you can use other funds. You just can't use any of the federal share of funds from the SAMHSA grant or any of the matching contributions. Next slide. Incentives are available to be used during this uh, program, but they're only able to be used for required data collection follow-up. So if you'd like to do a data collection follow-up that is a questionnaire, a survey, anything related to follow-up, you can have an incentive that does not exceed $30 in a non-cash value. Um, incentives cannot be used to encourage participation in any initial data collection, and they also cannot be used to encourage attendance at any programmatic event, um, activity, or training. Next slide. This is a standard uh, piece. It's um, indicated in your notice of award as well, but supplanting um, is not allowed. Funds should be used to supplement, meaning add to any of the uh, current program and resources, but these funds should not be used to replace any of the funding that is currently be, being used to support a program. Um, if, if you have any questions about supplanting, I would talk to your grants management specialist. I think this is an area that also comes up a lot where recipients aren't sure, is it, am I supplanting, am I supplementing? Like, which does this fall in? please reach out to your grants management specialist and they can help you um, determine which category uh, your, spe your specific situation falls into. Next slide. Post-award amendments um, are required largely for anything that requires prior approval. So prior approval just means that your federal agency that awarded the um, grant funds, meaning SAMHSA, needs to approve a cost before you're able to expend the funds um, to move forward with that. All prior approvals will be, be submitted in ERA, ERA Commons via the post-award amendment process. This um, slide here gives some resources for how to submit a post-award amendment um, and specific guidance on what 
each of the different documentation that you need in order to submit a post-award amendment. So if you are wanting to do a post-award amendment, please refer back to this slide. These links are very helpful and have information on all the different documents that are, are needed to complete a post-award amendment package and also how to submit it. If you do submit a post-award amendment and there are any questions that either the grants management specialist or the government project officer has, they will contact you via what is called a request for additional uh, materials. That's a communication that will be sent from ERA. And in that communication, they will ask for any additional documents or clarification that is needed. What is most important about the post award amendment, if you take away anything from this slide, is do not submit a post award amendment via email. If the documents are submitted via email, your grants management specialist is going to refer you to these resources to have you submit the post-award amendment via uh, ERA Commons. Next slide. This slide highlights uh, different, kind of the most common things that we see that require prior approval and would be necessary for you to submit a post-award amendment. So one is significant rebudgeting um, between the approved funds of the cost categories. So if you're re reallocating funds that exceed 25% of the total of your award, or the amount exceeds 250,000, um, whichever is less of those two, you would need to submit a, um, a budget revision um, and get prior approval for that. In addition, if you're purchasing any equipment that exceeds 25,000 per unit, you would need to submit a budget revision for that. Or if you wanna add a cost category um, to your award. So for example, when your budget was approved, you didn't put any supply items in there. If you would like to add a supply cost category to your award, you would need to submit a budget revision for that. Um, and then if you are a recipient who is on restricted status, a budget revision is required for any uh, revisions to the budget for a recipient that's on a restricted status. So in addition to budget revisions, um, carryovers also require prior approval. If the funds are greater than 25% of your current uh, budget period. So when you get to the end of your budget period, if you have unobligated funds that are greater than 25% of your current budget period award, you would need to submit a formal carryover with a um, budget narrative and also an explanation as to what those funds would be used for to get prior approval to um, have those carryover funds approved. In addition, things like a change in scope, if you want to uh, change the key staff of your awards, the key staff are indicated um, in the notice of funding opportunity, that will require prior approval, um, a no cost extension would. And then sometimes we get, if you have a merger or a transfer, those would also um, require prior approval. So this slide highlights some of the most frequent prior approval requests that we do see that require post-award amendment, but there, there are additional um, uh, things that would require prior approval. So if you have any questions about that, please reach out to your grants management specialist. Next slide. This is a super <clears throat> important part of the notice of award. Um, it's language in here that sometimes gets overlooked, but definitely wanna highlight it here that any of the funds that are awarded within a budget period, within the 12 month budget period, grantees should expect to plan their work so that they do expend those funds within the 12 month budget period. Carryover of funds into another budget period is not something that SAMHSA can guarantee. So it's always best practice to make sure that whatever you have planned during those 12 month budget period, that you're gonna be able to expend all of those funds um, because obviously, you know, we want these funds to go to good use and serve these different communities. Um, and we can't guarantee that a carryover will be approved. So please, 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 in your planning for this, um, ensure that the funds can be expended within that 12 month budget period. Next slide. Are there any questions about what we just uh, went over uh, regarding grants management? Now I see a question in the chat. 
does the expectation for spending within a 12 month period apply to multi-year awards as well? Yes, it does. Whether uh, the award is multi-year funded or not, that 12 month expectation um, does apply. And also on, on that, please refer to your notice of award for the specific amounts your grant is authorized to expend within each 12 month period. Are there any other questions? You can put it in um, the Q and A, or if you'd like to come Julie, off mute. Yeah, oh, go Julie ahead. and Aaron, this is Jennifer. I actually have a question. Are multi-year funded grantees required to submit carryover requests if um, they uh, have unobligated balances from year ones or, or their previous year? Uh, yes, they are. Um, uh, similar. A similar process applies to um, to annually funded grantees. Uh, just briefly, the carrying up of a process is uh, you need to submit your federal financial report on an annual basis no later than 90 days after the end of the budget period or incremental period as uh, as may apply. So this would the first one for for this group will be uh, in December 2025. Once we receive that, if the amount that you're requesting is uh, greater than 25% of your currently funded budget, which for this cohort, likely around 25,000, um, yeah. maybe more, maybe less, depending on the amount authorized, yeah. you will also need to submit a formal carryover request. That's a formal carryover post-award amendment. Um, otherwise, um, uh, you will uh, you will need to indicate that uh, you intend to carry over up to 25% in the federal financial report. But again, we'll have more information on that process as we get closer to, um, to that point in time. But yes, the carryover process is essentially um, the same. Uh, if you have to submit a formal carryover request, you will get a revised notice of award authorizing you to expend that. Otherwise, an intent to carry over will simply be uh, uh, granted once you once you receive confirmation that the federal financial report has been accepted. Okay. I see another question in the chat. When hiring new key personnel, should an amendment be filed for approval prior to them being hired? In general, I go ahead. In gen yeah, in general, yes. Um, if you have an idea of who you want to hire, but you may not have submitted the formal process, the formal uh, acceptance letter yet, it is recommended because there's always the possibility that SAMHSA will, for whatever reason, disapprove the uh, the key personnel change. Um, and so, if you do hire on this person before submitting the post award amendment application. Uh, any risks and costs associated with that hire will fall onto the grantee. SAMHSA doesn't make any guarantees about that. So if we disapprove it uh, and say that this person cannot be uh, uh, the particular key personnel, like a project director or something else, uh, then that person, uh, then you'll have to choose someone else to fulfill that role and you will need to uh, uh, and you will need to submit a new post award amendment application. Yeah, another thing to note is in the post award amendment package for the key personnel, we do ask that you include the start date or the anticipated start date. Um, so I would make sure that if you are going to submit uh, the key personnel request before the person is officially hired, you do still have all of the required documentation that's needed um, for us to look, review that package. Hi, Jillian and Aaron. I just, this is Portland. I just wanted to pause to clarify what do we mean by key personnel for this grant program? Because we know grantees hire, you know, project coordinators, evaluators, outreach workers. For purposes of this grant program and what we mean by key personnel, 
we are only referring to the project director, which is required at 15% level of effort. Am I correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you okay. for bringing that up. Uh, okay. Yes, for this particular grant, as listed in the uh, notice of fun a funding opportunity and listed on your notice of award, the only key personnel required is the project director. Uh, you might have other personnel that fulfill uh, key roles, but as far as uh, submitting changes in key personnel or the key personnel requirements, only the project director, specifically at 50% level of effort, is required for this grant. Okay. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, briefly, the Federal Financial Report, FFR or SF 425, is required on an annual basis and is due no later than 90 days after the end of the budget period. Uh, the FFR reflects cumulative amounts. So in year one, year one amounts. In year two, the second FFR will represent uh, amounts from both year one and year two, and the same for year three. So uh, as far as submission dates, no later than December 28th, 2025, uh, for the year beginning September 30th, 2024 through September 29th, 2025. That will be your first FFR. Uh, the next FFR will be due December 28th, 2026. And then the final FFR, um, if you are not requesting an, uh, a no-cost extension, um, it will be due 120 days after the end of the project. So uh, that means it will be due January 28th, 2028. However, if you have a no cost extension, uh, the actual submission date of the final FFR uh, will be uh, December 28th, 2027, 90 days after the end of the bu that budget period. Again, as we get closer to that, more information will be provided. Uh, uh, you submit the FFI directly through the payment management system. Uh, please, um, you can contact seamlessly to payment management system by clicking manage FFR button on the search for federal financial reports page in ERA comments. If you have any questions about how to set up a payment management system account, please contact the Payment Management System Help Desk at the email or phone number listed. Next slide, please. As a reminder, this grant has a matching requirement of $1 in matching funds for every $1 in federal funds expended. Um, matching contributions must meet the same test of allowability yeah. as cost charged to the grant. Um, and this must be met annually. So however much you expended in SAMHSA grant funds in one year, you will have to match that same amount. Um, changes in cost sharing or, ma or matching, such as a reduction in the amount of available funds, requires a budget revision. Your match is reported on your federal financial report in Section 10, um, Item J, Recipient Share of Expenditures. The minimum match requirement for each budget period is based on the funds expended during that particular budget period. Please note that for some of you, the match has been waived specifically for minority serving institutions and community colleges. On your initial notice of award, there will be a remark indicating that your specific organization has had that requirement waived. Otherwise, if you do not see that waiver, you will see information regarding cost sharing and matching requirements. Next slide, please. The programmatic progress report is due 90 days after the end of each budget period. Uh, in this case, December 28, 2025 for the first one. 
December 28th, 2026 for the second, and December 28th, 2027 for the final one. There will also be a closeout final programmatic progress report, uh, which is due no later than uh, January 28th, 2028. This might change depending on uh, whether or not you receive a no cost extension. Um, the project director is responsible for submitting this and you will submit the annual report. So the first three reports via the ERA Commons under the terms tracker. The final report will be submitted via the ERA Commons closeout module. You will receive information on the closeout process in your final year towards the end of the project. Next slide, please. For the grants that are awarded on an annual basis, you will submit a continuation application. Um, uh, the continuation application for each award can be found in ERA Commons. Typically, this is February 4th, um, 2025 for the upcoming application. Uh, the continuation applications are for the upcoming budget period only. So please do not include any carryover or supplementing supplemented funding associated with the current budget period. Uh, these can only be initiated and submitted through ERA Commons. You will need to have an active SAM.gov registration and submissions directly through grants.gov are not supported. More information can be found on the SAMHSA website. And as additional note, if your grant is multi-year funded, you won't submit it through ERA Commons, ERA Assist. You will submit the components via the ERA Terms Tracker as a, as a term, and you will find information on your Notice of Award. Next slide, please. Here are just a summary of key submission dates for the upcoming period. Uh, most terms and conditions, special terms and conditions are due October 30th, so at the end of this month via the ERA Terms Tracker. The disparity impact statement is due 60 days after the start of the project, so November 29th, 2024, again through the Terms Tracker. The continuation application, as just mentioned, if it's applicable, will be will need to be submitted no later than February 4th, 2025 via the ERA Commons Manage Continuations tab. If you're a multi-year funded, if you're a multi-year funded grant, you will be submitting that through the ERA Terms Tracker, and information on that is on your notice of award. The Federal Financial Report is submitted through the Payment Management System, uh, and it is due December 28th, 2025. Carryover requests are due with the annual FFR. If formal, if you're requesting more than 25%, you will need to also submit a post-award amendment. And then the programmatic progress report is submitted via the ERA terms tracker. And that is due December 28th, 2025. Next slide, please. Just a few other tips. All requests must be submitted through ERA Commons. Um, to expedite the review of any requests requiring a detailed budget, we recommend using the um, SAMHSA's budget template. This isn't required, but we highly recommend it. Um, regarding the budget narrative and justification, uh, to facilitate what our determination of whether these costs are allowable, allocable, and reasonable, please provide, provide sufficient narrative to explain how each cost relates to the achievements of the goals and objectives of the grant and provide calculations, detailed breakdowns of the materials, quantities, and so forth, and any other relevant basis and information. This is also required for any matching contributions. The more information you provide, the easier it is for us to determine if a cost is allowable. Uh, please make sure you submit your currently approved into a cost rate agreement or cost allocation plan with every budget if you are using those, if you're using the de minimis rate or if you're not using any uh, indirect costs, then that's not required as long as you indicate that in the budget. Um, 
guidance on uh, on using the budget template as well as sample budgets can be found on the link provided. And uh, blank SF424 and 424A forms can be found on grants.gov. Next slide, please. As a reminder, when communicating with SAMHSA, um, please make sure you include your grant number um, in the subject line of all correspondence. Uh, this will be in the form of uh, SM01234 one, two, three, four, five. Um, and you can include the dash zero one dash zero two, but as long as we have um, the SM zero one, two, three, four, five, uh, we'll be able to look up your grant. Additionally, please include your name, position title, organization name, and work contact information when communicating with us so we can get back to you. Next slide, please. Uh, briefly, uh, you draw down funds by requesting them from the payment management system. If you're not on restricted status, which none of your grants should be at the moment, you may make electronic fund transfers as often as needed. Please um, ensure that drawdowns are made on an as-needed basis solely to accommodate immediate needs. You will need to make sure that these funds are expended within three working days. Uh, please see the link provided for the three-day rule on spending funds. Uh, refer to the uh, website provided on setting up new user accounts, updating user access, uh, checking the status of your user account requests, and so forth. For assistance with your payment management system account, uh, please contact your payment man management system liaison accountant, which you can find on the link provided. And if you run into any technical difficulties, please reach out to the Payment Management System Help Desk with the information provided. Next slide, please. These are additional resources, which um, include resources on SAMHSA's grants website, as well as resources on ERA's website. There's also resources on the Payment Management System website and also links to various policies and procedures, as well as various regulations. Again, these are all in the slides, which everyone will receive. Uh, next slide, please. All right, any questions for this section? Hi, Aaron. We do have a question posted in the Q&A, um, and it says, um, if you have another SAMHSA grant already, do you have one ERA Commons and PMS login or separate for each grant? So that that's based on the, you can have one um, login for each, or you can have uh, one for each grant. Um, it's up to the organization what they prefer. Mm -hmm. um, if you use the same, um, uh, payment management system account, uh, you'll just need to make sure you search appropriately. Um, on your notice of award, you'll see what's called a document number. It should be of the form, uh, in this case, 24 SM8 something, 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 and then it'll end in an A, usually. Uh, that's the number that you'll need to use to look up your account information specifically for this grant. Um, I want to emphasize that because there are cases where grantees with multiple grants will draw down funds from the wrong account, mm -hmm. um, even though uh, uh, without realizing it. So please make sure to uh, use that document number. Uh, if you have trouble finding that, feel free to reach out. But uh, you can have separate accounts. It's usually, but it's usually perfectly fine to have the same account. Great, thank you. We have a few more questions regarding drawdown. If mm -hmm. we draw down monthly, do we need a one-to-one -one match for each drawdown or is it a one-to-one -one match for the budget period of the year? 
So with that one, uh, matching is reported on a yearly basis. So uh, for the entire uh, budget period for that year, that's the amount that you need to make sure you match. So if you are able to provide matching funds for grant funds all at once uh, in the beginning of the year and then towards the end of the year, you use grant funds, that's fine. Uh, you can also have it one-to-one -one across each month. It, it's really up to you as long as at the end of the day or at the end of the year, technically, um, the amount of funds you expended um, is matched in some way. Okay. The, another related question, could you also draw down funds after the funds are expensed rather than draw down before? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you, uh, this will go to your um, accounting basis, there's various nuances to that, but in general, if you expend funds, um, you can then go into payment management system uh, and get disbursement as a, uh, uh, as a repayment for the funds expended. So you would be reimbursed in that case instead of getting funds to directly pay for any activity. It just depends on your accounting system. Another question regarding matching funds. Mm -hmm. I think there's a wide range of different ways, you know, to meet your, your matching requirement. The question is, can matching funds be quote unquote in kind? Yes, absolutely. Um, for instance, if personnel are uh, are providing work in kind, that counts towards the match. Uh, if the if your uh, uh, organization provides uh, any kind of service or supplies uh, that you don't pay for explicitly with separate funds. That would count as long as they adhere to the same grant related requirements of being allowable, allocable, and reasonable. Any other questions regarding? And I know it's a lot of information that Aaron Harris and his team has covered regarding grants management. Any other questions you'd like to ask or post in the Q&A? I do see one asking about if your organization did not receive them, um, the matching waiver, if, if mm -hmm. is there something we can apply to or request? No, that was me mm -hmm. um, entirely at the programmatic level, uh, high up to basically based on the type of institution for minority serving institutions as well as for community colleges. So that, that's something specific to, uh, uh, that decision has already been made. It's not something you can apply to. We have another question here, which member of the executive cabinet does this grant fall under? I'm not quite sure. Um, well, the, the SAMHSA grants are under the Health and Human Services, so the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, yeah, so under, uh, so it would be uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services in that case. Um, um, let me see here. I think I saw another question, but Jennifer may have been attending to it. Let's see if there's any other questions. Yeah, I just responded to a question about the grantee meeting, which is the conference that is referred to in the note of flow. Um, which Portland indicated we're not going to have a conference in 2025. We will, we're looking to have one in 2026. So there's a question about reallocating funding. So what I said was if you are 
if you had budgeted for the conference in 2025, then you may reallocate that funding to another allowable um, activity or conference. And you can work with your GPO on that changes less than 25% of your total annual award do not need prior approval from SAMHSA. Um, typically travel for that conference would not exceed 25% of your budget. <clears throat> Yes, that is a big announcement, but we will not be having the SAMHSA grantee meeting. Thank you, Jennifer. In 2025, we plan to have it in 2026. So please work individually with your GPO on, on those related questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other questions regarding grants management? Yes, yeah, so I, there's a question here. What are allowable conferences? So conferences mm -hmm. that are relevant to collegiate mental health, to the work you're doing. Um, um, of course, I'm blanking right now. Um, yeah. NCHA, I think, has an annual conference. A lot of grantees go to the... Um, NASPA. NASPA conference. Um, AAS, mm -hmm. um, American Association for Suicidology. Um, so there are a variety. You can talk to your GPO about what, what you find out there and whether it would be reasonable. Yeah, they should, uh, the conference should, should be, you know, of course be related to campus suicide prevention and collegiate mental health, and they should be domestic. There was a fabulous conference, an international conference, I think it was in Paris or Ireland, but, you know, unfortunately you can only use SAMHSA grant funds for domestic travel. Okay. Um, the National Counseling Centers Director, NCCD. Um, yes, that's a wonderful example of uh, a conference that many of our grantees attend and a wonderful way to connect with your peers. Any other questions, grants management questions? As this does conclude the grants management uh, segment of today's webinar, and then we just have a few other uh, brief updates to share with you. And it looks like, okay, so we're gonna move on to SPARS. Um, SPAR stands for SAMHSA's um, Performance Accountability Reporting System. It is SAMHSA's web-based centralized data collection and monitoring system um, that we use to meet the GIPRA mandate here. Um, we um, are gonna be providing um, a detailed training. Can you go to the next slide, please? I think that's helpful. Everything that you need to know about and, and with respect to SPARS will be provided to you at this training on November 13th at two o'clock. It'll be about an hour and a half training. Um, after you complete this training, you will know everything you need to know to successfully meet the upcoming deadline of December 30th. By December 30th, grantees are required to set and enter their annual uh, goals, their annual SPARS goals for each required indicator. And again, we're gonna be providing you with all that information at this training. Prior to the training, however, we ask that the project directors set up their user account. So if we could go to the next slide, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, the previous slide, I'm sorry. So the SPARS help desk should have sent the project directors an email um, introducing, uh, introducing project directors to SPARS, again, which is the online data entry and reporting system here at SAMHSA, and to assist project directors with setting up their user account, this 
email uh, included an attachment. It's a form called the and remove SPARS user request form. We ask that project directors please complete that form and submit it by email to the SPARS help desk at Mathematica uh, slash NPR.com, the email here listed on the slide. Again, if you have not received the email from the SPARS help desk attaching this SPARS user's request form, please contact your government project officer. That's you know either myself, Portland, Jennifer, Amber, or Tara. Okay. So that's all you really need to do with respect to SPARS. If you could do that before the, the November 13th training, that would be great. Next slide, please. We just wanted to highlight a few things before we conclude today's webinar. SAMHSA Grants Management website here, www.samhsa.gov is chock full of information and resources. Um, you wanna click on the grants management site, scroll down to grants management for all information that you need, for example, regarding all post-award administrative requirements. Next slide, please. We covered a lot of information today, and I know it's very overwhelming as a new grantee, but we do wanna highlight some official documents that grantees should always keep handy and refer to throughout the life of the grant. One is the notice of award. I think based on my experience here as a government project officer, eight out of 10 grant questions that I receive from grantees are contained in your notice of award. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have your notice of award available at all times, because I guarantee you, most of your questions are, con most of your questions you will find answered in your notice of award. The other important document that you need to refer to of course, is your approved budget and application. And in that application is your re approved work plan. So you're gonna, you know, this is your master document that, you, that you're gonna be talking about with your GPO and monitoring, you know, reporting out in terms of your, your budget spending, as well as your, your program implementation activities. And then again, another reminder about, you know, the SAMHSA Grants Management website, you might want to save this as a favorite, bookmark this, you know, on your computer. And I can't emphasize enough how useful and informative SAMHSA's grants, grants Management website is for grantees. Okay. And our final slide here is, um, you know, as a new grantee, I know you must feel overwhelmed with uh, all of the information and resources that we provided to you today in today's webinar. And you're thinking, gosh, what do I do now? So to help you with competing priorities, we wanted to just list the most important key startup activities and next steps that you need to be engaged in right now. The first thing we want you to do, if you haven't already done so, is to follow up with your GPO on their welcome letter that they sent to you and schedule your first individual introductory call with your GPO. And they're gonna be really sitting down with you, walking through everything um, as it relates to your specific grant. And they're also gonna be talking with you about how they're gonna be working with you over the three years on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, the next step is make sure the organization and the project director are registered in ERA Commons. Um, you wanna make sure that you're also registered and set up with a payment management system and you're drawing down funds. Um, as we talked about and as highlighted in our welcome GPL letter, review your notice of award and respond to all of the terms and conditions by the deadline. Uh, the other 
key activity is you want to make sure the application checklist with your business official and project director and related contact information is correct. Um, and please keep in mind the business official and project director should be different people. So if there are any changes with your business official or project director, please contact your government project officer immediately and keep us updated. And then finally, please complete and submit the SPARS user request form uh, to the SPARS uh, help desk so we can help you uh, set up your SPARS user account. Okay. So that completes our webinar for today. We wanna to pause again for any final questions that you have before we conclude today's webinar. And we're gonna look here at the Q&A. Any questions, Jennifer? that you see posted? I don't see any. I see Christine Conway has her hand raised. I don't know if that is a question or an accident. Um, otherwise, I see no questions. I mean, please remember your GPO is available. There's no expectation that you're going to remember all of this um, right now. But like Portland said, it's all in your notice of award. So it's all written down for you and your GPO will help you guide you through everything. Make sure you're reporting on time and appropriately and you're properly trained. Next slide, please. This is just a reminder of your, of your team here at SAMHSA who will be working with you to provide you with all the support and technical assistance you need to ensure that you're successfully uh, implementing the goals and objectives of your grant and serving the needs of your, of your students. Um, so our job is to make your life easier so that you could really focus on um, implementing the grant objectives and goals of your grant. Okay. Any other questions posted or anyone has their hand up that would like to ask any questions? I don't see anything. Great. Well, thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. It was so wonderful to meet you and we're so excited um, to work with you over the next three years and to learn so much about all the wonderful work that you're doing there at your institutions. And um, we look so forward to talking with you on the upcoming, um, our upcoming first call with your GPOs, which uh, will be happening very soon if they haven't happened already. So thank you so much and have a good rest of the day. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think we still have a few people on, but mm -hmm. I'm sure. You're still recording too. Oh, thank you.